It's a, it's a sort of a, a nice place for conversation. And then there'll be a happy hour back here at five o'clock under the tent. We're trying not to wear you out. So if you need points during the day where you can, can recharge. So, um, who are you? You want me to go check that? I'll get Phoebe. Phoebe, you know where Peter is? Has anybody seen Peter Davis? Why don't you see if we can bring him out? 592. 592. <laughs> 592. Yeah. He might be over here in the map. He might be in Porter. Yeah, 592. He's, oh, Phoebe. Yes. I think he's over here in the in, in Porter in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in this building. Yes. Yes. Welcome to our coffee with great documentarians this morning. Uh, Jay is going to lead this conversation. Um, and. <laughs> So, Mo Nakvi is here, Steve James is here, Barbara Koppel is here, we'll hope to have Peter Davis here shortly. Uh, we're scheduled to run until about 9.45 this morning. Barbara will be leaving us about 9.15, so she'll get all the first 16 questions. Very good. Just kidding, Barbara. Definitely not. Right. Barbara will listen. <laughs> yeah, one of the nice things about this event, which we've now had every year, is that it feels it comes closest to feeling like shooting a film this hour of the morning and the feeling in the air and right you know except usually about two hours earlier than this but uh, anyway um, I was hoping Peter would be here because the first question was sort of uh, linked to something he brought up but maybe we can uh, yeah, yeah. here he is good yeah. yes great the mentor yeah. <laughs> um, He's going the wrong direction. Okay. All right. <laughs> there we go. Okay. There we go. How are you? Good to see you. Yes. Thank you. Well, you're, it's fine. You're just. You're, it's fashionably late. You. You know. You're from Boston, so we. We make allowances. <laughs> That's okay. Anyway, um, to sort of jump right in, and Barbara is only here for 45 minutes, so we're going to, you know, try to cover some material before she has to leave. But I think the, one of the interesting things about documentary, and our festival is really seeing many more documentaries that are being submitted that are worthy and important and, and uh, ultimately end up getting programmed than we are nas um, narrative films. And I, I attribute some of that just to the state of distribution where it's so hard for filmmakers to recoup costs of filmmaking but maybe we'll go into that later but maybe we won't but I think that the documentary continues to be you know a vital force and, and what's interesting about it is that like all film there's it's such an elastic form uh, it can be um, you know it, it functions as visual art as sort of cultural artifact as oral history as investigative journalism um, and I guess I'd like to sort of open by getting some response from the filmmakers about the nature of their own work and what they see as the principal role that documentary plays at this moment in time. Um, and I mean, Peter had brought up in our earlier conversations this notion of documentary of, as investigative broadcast journalism. Uh, at an era where we're seeing a resurgence in, in investigative journalism. I felt around the year 2000 it was sort of slackening off, but print journalism has come back in the last few years really to be a strong force in investigation. And, huh? Well, Trump has sort of influenced some of that for sure. The question was, are there any periodicals that are up to the challenge? Because we know that in the 60s investigative reporting was quite important. Uh, so, including, of course, Tom Herman is also with us today, and I want to invite him to offer some thoughts, but sort of investigating the investigators, which is what he does in his film uh, Dateline Saigon, and the critical importance of investigative journalism during the Vietnam War. Uh, Peter's film Hearts and Minds, which is playing at 10.30 this morning, um, you know, broke ground, really made news, I think, particularly through its uh, interviews with Walt Rostow, uh, General William Westmoreland, Clark Clifford, the French Foreign Minister, George Bideau. All of this stuff was news and new and revelatory. So let's just talk a little bit about, you know, what role documentary plays uh, with consideration to the question of investigative journalism, but also beyond. So why don't we start with you, Peter? Thank you. Jay, and thank all of you for being here. I think that 
documentary journalism, which I practiced when I was at CBS News, is kind of uh, the fourth branch of government, uh, which the press has often been called, um, but which it didn't, it, it goes through periods that are almost somnolent. Uh, you feel like, well, for instance, uh, I happen to remember the 1950s. Uh, we were kind of asleep and comfortable in the 1950s when I was in school. And the 60s got us going again. Well, anyway, obviously, obviously, the uh, Vietnam War got us going again and got documentary journalism. Incidentally, I just have to say, I think documentaries are better now than when I was making them. Yeah. And uh, I mean, a lot better. And it, it's partly the audience that did this. There's now an appetite for nonfiction films. And it's just great. I, I love that. Um, I think after the Vietnam War, things slumped a little and also and I'll talk more about this um, when we see Hearts and Minds, um, or, or maybe The Selling of the Pentagon, my investigative film that's showing this afternoon. Um, I think that we did learn a lesson in the Vietnam War. And uh, as a friend of mine put it, we learned that we don't do well in away games. In other words, there was no real threat to us in Vietnam, and yet there we were. I think we learned a lesson, and we didn't go into any big wars again for a generation. And then I feel like 9-11 was sort of like a blow to our head, and uh, it caused amnesia. We forgot the lesson, and now we're in an endless war in Afghanistan, and a war that doesn't show any uh, signs of ending in Iraq, all of which makes documentary journalism all the more important. And I'm talking too much now. I think I should give it to somebody else. You never talk too much. Because what you have to say is really so interesting. I love to hear you talk. You're welcome. So I'm just very proud to be part of this panel with all these incredible documentarians and fiction and documentary. Uh, I just think for me that we live in very serious and very dangerous times and people are craving for information, but not only information, it's also for understanding. And documentary films have a way of just digging deep and really going to the heart of the matter and really struggling to see what makes people tick. And for me, no matter what the subject is or what the story is, we sometimes think that, okay, we know all about this, but generally we don't. And I think taking it beyond the stereotype and really allowing people to have stories that will be timeless, like Hearts and Minds, for example, that now is as relevant now as it was then, because we learn so much about the materials that we do. I don't know. <laughs> that was very well said, I thought. <laughs> hey. I, <laughs> well, we, we, you're cut. No, no, that was great. That, that wasn't a sarcastic comment. Um, no, in, in fact, when you were speaking, I was. it made me think of this Roger Ebert quote the way, that he made about movies, but I think applies much more to documentary, really, which is, is that the movies or documentaries are a machine to create empathy you know yeah, and I, yeah. and that's something that's used that that the movies and we're, we're saying documentaries uh, are a machine to create empathy um, and that's certainly something that's very strong in Barbara's entire body of work uh, the way she digs in with subjects 
and helps you understand what's going on in, in complex situations. Um, and I think, I mean, you know, I think the other thing is just something, Jay, you were saying, which is, is that part of what's so exciting about right now is, is that I think it used to be that documentaries were put in a kind of box <clears throat> of being just journalism, and I don't mean just in a dismissive way, but limited to journalism. Um, and, and, you know, kind of like you do your homework by watching them. Um, you, you eat your vegetables kind of thing. And, and that's changed dramatically. Um, you can kind of do anything in documentaries now. And any genre you can think of, there is a documentary in that genre now um, that used to only apply to fiction, right? So, and I think that's wonderful. And they, documentaries become such a, a means of personal expression that can also be deeply um, engaged in what's going on in the world around us. You know, it's not just, it's not like navel gazing. It's, it's deeply tied to what we're all dealing with. So that's what's exciting to me about documentary. <laughs> well, first of all, um, I'd just like to say thank you so much for making me be part of the panel. Some of the mentors I've grown up with, you know, Barbara and, and Steve and Peter and I've studied your work and it kind of inspired me to become a documentarian, so this is a real treat and privilege for me, and thanks so much, Jay, for making that happen. Oh, thanks. Um, <clears throat> I, I guess, came of age and I moved to New York right after finishing college in August of 2001, and that is very significant because as a Pakistani Muslim, uh, new immigrant to the States, that clearly influenced what kind of a filmmaker I was going to be. And investigative journalism, I never set out to you know, go down that route, but it has followed me in all of the films that I've made. Um, I come from a place that is deeply misunderstood, I'd say in the West, but especially in the United States. Sorry. <laughs> um, and uh, we take such nuanced um, political, social scenarios and distill them into very polarized black and white caricatures, which I find in some regards, it can even be dangerous. And I think that's what long form documentaries gives us uh, the tools to further explore which current affairs does not. And um, I think that's primarily what I strive for. Um, so even for example, if you are covering um, a, a supporter of ISIS, uh, like I did in my previous film, Among the Believers, I don't just go in there um, and spend half a day with them with a bunch of fixers, I leave. I spent five years with this man and I formed my own relationship with him. And then in that process, investigative journalism wasn't so much about me investigating the story as it was uh, investigating myself and checking my own internalized um, prejudices and misconceptions and breaking those. And at least for me, I find those are the most exciting stories that I want to tell, where I put myself to the task and challenge, so, yeah. Good right. yeah. round robin here. Yeah, I mean, I think people may not know Mo's work as well as some of the other filmmakers, but um, he's, he's showing two of his films uh, here, and we had one of his films, uh, among the Believers, a couple of years ago, who saw that film? Anybody in the in the room that saw that film? Yeah, it was a very powerful picture that explored the um, madrasa schools in uh, Pakistan, uh, schools where it's sort of a jihadist point of view is advocated, and, and it, it it reveals complexity that goes way beyond again what we know through our cursory understanding uh, of the dynamics in Pakistan, for one, the social dynamics. Uh, and the political dynamics, and just who the people are. And I think that um, 
that's I think what what uh, Steve said and what about Barbara's work too, creating empathy for people that we because we are inundated with so much information in our culture we don't get complex deeper views but when we pause and leave that world and spend time in a doc with a documentary film things bubble up I think one of the reasons the documentaries have become so much uh, more important is that is that in the early days documentary was sort of just informational film you know I mean it was sort of the instructional picture of the 50s type of thing but that by developing subtext and by having elements in play that reveal things to us that we didn't really even know, even as filmmakers, was there. I mean, so I want to explore a question, just an example. I mean, for me, for example, most films, Shame, which is playing in the festival, I guess today, yeah, uh, about a, a Muslim woman in a small village in Pakistan who is subjected to honor justice, so-called, by being raped in her village, uh, revealed to me partly that, you know, a dis and who th this injustice was brought to light through a Muslim cleric in the next village and became an international incident and where this woman acts with extraordinary courage, resilience, and vision as her response to this terrible situation. It's, it's an uplifting film at the same time that reveals the horror of that situation. But it's just full of revelation. And one of my revelations watching it was the difference between a Muslim cleric and what was essentially a feudal practice that, that really clarified for me and demystified this notion, this demonization we place on Islam and what thing, and it's these practice, you know, practices. But anyway, likewise, when I saw Steve's film yesterday, uh, America to me, I mean, I saw these racial dynamics in play, uh, very complex characters, and of course, character drives documentary principally. But I also saw the limits of education as it is currently practiced, and how in some ways the institutional aspects, and I think this was true in Frederick Wiseman's high school as well, the confining aspects of education as it's currently practiced, and how in some ways the larger goals of, of really integrating this community are inhibited by the institutional constraints that are placed upon the day-to-day -day experience of these kids. Which in some ways, in personal statement, I saw kids being given an opportunity to take leadership unusually and becoming transformed through it you know and so these are all things that are subtextual they're not stated in any way I mean in Barbara's Harlan County USA you know the, the, what I saw was you know a, a demonstration of courage of intelligence of art articulation of community dynamics of power structures I mean again it goes way beyond the simple story that is told although the stories in each of these cases are very well told. So the idea of documentary as narrative becomes key, and I think one of the reasons that documentary is ascendant is that the narratives that are articulated are more immediate to us, more relevant to us in many ways, certainly than commercial cinema, is giving, uh, narrative cinema is giving us right now. Well, and more... Um... So let's talk a little bit about that, these subtextual elements, and things maybe that even you discovered in making your films that you didn't expect, or even discovered after the film was done right. that still bubbled up for you? Well, I was just, yeah, I was just going to say that um, I think one of the reasons documentary is so vital today, besides the, the sort of no-holds-barred aesthetic choices one can make, is, is that the stories we're telling don't fit into simple boxes. And documentary challenges you as a filmmaker to find a way to tell the story that's true to what you, you've discovered. But that rarely conforms to the three-act structure <laughs> of traditional narrative cinema and Aristotelian drama and all that. You know, it's like you have to grapple with what you have and, and make it coherent and clear and embrace its complexity. And that's not something that happens frequently in narrative cinema, or it doesn't happen enough, let's just say. So, um, but yeah, I think uh, for me, um, I have found myself doing films about things that, that bother me or I can't quite understand how I feel about them. And so, you know, um, a series like America Me is, you know, we I've lived in that community for a long time and couldn't quite understand how such a liberal community that took such enormous pride in its diversity and, and had well-funded schools um, 
somehow managed to not really deal with issues of inequities in education, but also not have really honest conversations about race. You know, with a bunch of liberals sitting around not really talking frankly and honestly about race, because everyone knows just enough to know what not to say, um, to not appear to say the wrong thing. And it frustrates the black members of the community and, and uh, very much. Uh, it's one of the things that's so frustrating for them um, is the, the village's image of itself. <laughs> and so, you know, going into doing this film, this series was about really trying to investigate that and understand that, and also understand where I fall in that as a white man in that community um, who's lived there for a long time and up until doing this film hadn't really paid any attention of any real note at a deeper level as to what's going on there. So I was like long overdue to do something myself in, in that area. Barbara, how about it? Just the idea of discovery, uh, revelation to you in making a film, ending up somewhere you didn't expect. Uh, just yeah. Okay, Barbara. I'm just asking Barbara to continue. Okay, the conversation. I will continue the conversation. Um, I think for me, what means the most is really getting to the heart of the matter. And as we talked a little bit, you know, the news just sort of surfaces over things. And for me, it's to really go deep and go into the souls of people. And it can be any story. It can be the most unlikely story. I mean, you think you know who Mariel Hemingway is, you know, an actress, but little do you know that she suffered seven suicides in her family. And her daughters hardly know who her grandfather is and it's just so interesting to see different people talking about things that um, are so intimate to them and really take us a long way in understanding what mental illness is all about or whether it's poverty or whether it's education or whether it's war all of these films have such um, depth and passion with them. And for me, you know, going on location and finding characters that I want to spend a year or two years with, I figure if I want to and they captivate me and I can't go home for that year or two years, then other people are going to want to see what these stories are about. And I just feel like I'm the luckiest person ever to be able to have people trust me, to have them open up and to really talk about the things that they've never talked about before. I'm wondering um, about impact. I mean, in making a documentary film, do you think at all about the impact that it will have? Uh, and if so, what kinds of impacts do you see from it? What kinds of impacts might you have anticipated? What impacts maybe surprised you? Uh, I mean, I'm going to start with Peter because Peter made argu was involved with arguably two of the largest impact documentaries ever made. He was a writer on hunger in America. Uh, 1960s CBS documentary played prime time, played to a massive audience back in the days of only three networks, and the next day, literally in Congress, action started, and the White House had no choice but to yield to this move to address questions of hunger in America. Likewise, with selling of the Pentagon, immediately congressional investigations that changed, at least over the short term, what was going on there. So starting here, I mean, these films clearly at some level were made to have impact, yes? To address these issues, and if so, what surprised you and where did it go? And Middleton, right. Okay, Middleton. Well, I, I, I first want to comment on something that Barbara said and take it even further. Um, it was probably also true of, of Steve and Mo. I always have ended up somewhere different from where I expected to be. Um, and, uh, okay. Jay mentioned the selling of the Pentagon. Well, I started out to make a film about 
um, the PR departments of all of the government, the State Department, the Justice Department, all of them. And I did like three months of research expecting to do that. And, uh, but I kept coming back to the Pentagon, back and back and back. And finally, I said to my superiors at CBS News, I think this film has got to just be about the Defense Department. Well, okay, um, that's just one way that research influences and in a way controls development. Now, Jay asked, you know, do, do we make these films um, in order to have an impact? Honestly, Jay, I hope they do have an impact, but I wasn't thinking about that when I was making them. I was thinking about how can I be true? I, I, I love what Mo said. How can I be true to something in myself that wants to make this film? Uh, that became even more true in the Middletown series that I did, where it's not showing here. And so, but but each of those films ended up very differently than uh, I had expected it to. And uh, so, do you want me to shut up? No, 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 keep going. No, Barbara has to leave. Oh, Barbara. Okay. Oh my God, she should have the last word. I'll get that. Well, my last word is, Tom, come take my place. <laughs> and it's been a pleasure, and documentaries are so phenomenal. Um, every time I go into one, I never know what to expect. And they just take me around a corner and into a world I never knew and that I'm so happy to be in. So I'm glad that people are watching them now and understanding that they're, you know, they make you sad, they make you happy and hopeful and they're entertaining. And they have great music connected with them and I hope you all just continue to watch them and get your friends into those theaters. Thanks. Let's continue the conversation about, um, you know, what effect these films have. I mean, I was surprised uh, when I asked the crowd at um, Abacus who had seen Hoop Dreams. There were probably 100, 120 people there. And I think about 10 or 12 hands went up. Uh, and it surprised me. You know, when I asked a group, more than that, maybe more than that. Maybe that's just me. Right. Well, <laughs> yes, we all tend to... Uh, I er saw more hands. You saw more hands. Um, how many people in this group have seen Hoop Dreams? Okay, well, this is the wrong group. I'm not, it's not the group I want to talk to. You were all there last night, right? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> anyway, uh, who's seen Hearts and Minds? Okay, not, not as many. Okay. Who's seen... Well, we showed Harlan County. I mean, when we showed Harlan County, USA a couple of years ago, we had a full house. I mean, most of the people had not seen the film. I mean, the, what, the, the upside of that is that independent films never saturate their market. But part of my concern right now is that all of these great films are made. We don't have a terribly strong public television system. And are these, I mean, what happens to these movies? I mean, they're important. They go, they, they find their way as sort of entertainment commodities into the Netflix system or whatever. Is there something that any of us think would be ideal going forward to increase the utilization of this material uh, to continue to affect young people, for example? And, you know, we literature, we sort of know where to get it, we know how to get it, we know it's there, although there are questions related to all intellectual property right now, but, you know, how do we, going beyond the question of immediate impact, I mean, I tried to get Selling of the Pentagon and Hunger in America online, I couldn't find it anywhere. 
These are important pieces. Where are they? What, what, what should be going on to ensure that these resources remain available and sources for discussion and consideration? Well, we'll start at the other end and come back to you, Peter. I mean, Mo, how many, you know? Sure, well, um, I'm sure the rest of the panel can talk a lot more just because just the, the lens of experience, but something that wasn't around which I think is when I first started and uh, and compared to the last two pre the most recent films that I've made aside from just making the film and getting the funds together to actually make it and, and then get it out there and hopefully get it distributed beyond that I think all filmmakers also have to start planning for its impact release and how there's actual specific social uh, impact producers now where you go beyond just traditional distribution whether it be a small theatrical release or a broadcast or an SVOD deal on Netflix or something you actually partner with NGOs and not-for-profits and universities and other uh, viable communities and, and foundations across the US and North America and then also beyond of course and you actually screen those films in those engaged communities and you have to find synergies that of whatever your film is and, and it's really operating at a grassroots level and I think some films have uh, managed to extend the impact of their film quite organically really by, by, by doing that and just by having newer tools available to us through the use of social media or whatever, so, yeah. No, I think that's exactly right. I mean, I, I think the, the flip side of the sort of golden age of documentary that we're allegedly living in, not allegedly, we really are, <laughs> is that there's so much content out there now. And so the first hurdle, right, is you've made a great film and is anybody going to see it? Not, not, not just will it live in, live on, but is anybody going to see it now? And I, I think that that's a real... You know that's a real issue for a lot of films that you you know you see these films that are terrific and hardly anybody s sees them and um, I don't know what to do about that honestly but I think that if you make a film that catches on in some way uh, and to piggyback on what you were saying for me a, a film of mine that that is akin to what you were talking about is this film I did the interrupters which it the distribution of that film was it, it was a PV, you know, frontline collaboration. So um, we, they only spent um, ninety thousand dollars to get it out theatrically. <laughs> that was it, and that's not a lot of money. Um, you know, that's that's making the trailer. That's you know, that's the company that handled it, like taking a little bit of money for themselves. You know, and then postage stamp ads to qualify it for the Academy and the New York Times and the LA Times. <laughs> anyway, the good news about it was is that even despite such limited resources, the film um, got into so many um, theatrical settings, it, even if it was just for a weekend at a, at, at, at a theater that booked it for just a weekend instead of a week-long run. Um, we started to get, because of its topic and subject matter, we started to get a lot of inquiries from people out in the field um, who are trying to grapple with these issues of, of urban violence or um, you know, a, a whole host of, um, you know, we, we heard from police departments, we heard from uh, you know, legal organizations, we heard from community organizations. And so it kind of was this groundswell. And so it got out there, not because we had the money to put it out there, but it got out there because it did strike a chord. So I think that the films that, that are able to break through and the films that can have a longer life, oftentimes, you know, they have to strike some kind of chord in the, in the ethos, you know, what's going on now that allow that to happen, which is, un which is great for them. It's unfortunate for a great number of documentaries that don't, just don't happen to have that going for them that are still terrific documentaries and, and, and will struggle to be seen. I mean, Netflix, Netflix, you read about a Netflix, thing 
and you go to the next you just read about it right and then you go to the site and you can't even find it on the site and it just came out you have to like go to the search and search thing to find the thing there's something wrong with that <laughs> that it's just out and you can't find it on the home page my name is Tom Herman I'm new to the panel <laughs> Uh, and sitting in figuratively the, the very big chair that uh, that Barbara Koppel vacated uh, so I'm honored to be here with all of you. Uh, I produced and directed a film uh, called Dateline Saigon which screened yesterday maybe some of you have seen it and uh, the question Jay that you posed is something that I'm uh, it's very much alive in my daily activity and my wake up in the middle of the night worries. Uh, Dateline Saigon is a film uh, about Vietnam, but it really, even more fundamentally, is a film about journalism and the importance of an independent press speaking truth to power, keeping government accountable, which uh, some might say is quite timely today. Uh, one of the things I have learned is when you're done making a film, you aren't done making, you aren't done with the film. You, you're beginning a whole new and perhaps equally difficult process of getting it distributed as an independent filmmaker. Uh, and I'm in the middle of that now. I've got a film that uh, I'm, uh, I'm happy with and, and other people seem to be, but now the struggle is for distribution. Now beyond that, once I hope I will have distribution, or maybe at the same time, there is so much content that I as a filmmaker, we as filmmakers, uh, gather uh, that is not even in the film, however, uh, that is important to capture and get out to an audience. So it's our plan, and we're beginning this process now of writing grant applications to create um, a robust uh, uh, educational website that can deal with many of the issues about uh, journalism, how to be a journalist, the impact of journalism, uh, so that this uh, uh, website uh, can have a curriculum that can be used in high schools, in colleges, in graduate schools, in journalism schools. And it can go so far beyond what is even in the film. And uh, uh, I have five principal characters in the film. I interviewed well over 50 photojournalists, print journalists, TV journalists, etc. So perhaps the most interesting of whom, though, the great women reporters, for example, who aren't even in my film, but uh, maybe someday I'll be able to make another film about them. And I think, uh, let me hand it over to the great Peter Davis. Well, <clears throat> I think that the uh, problem that Steve began to talk about, which is distribution, what does happen to our films? Yeah, everybody's mentioned it. Um, the other day I was on a plane and they were giving you a whole raft of choices. And I wonder if maybe the airlines aren't a little bit ahead now of the distribution system. For instance, one of the films that they were offering was Are You My Neighbor? The film about Mr. Rogers. Uh, I happen to have already seen that in a theater, but I think it, it was great that nonfiction films were being offered in the air. So, this is the kind of thing we need to encourage more of or discover more of. I mean, distribution, it's the huge problem, uh, as Steve said, for wonderful films that don't get seen very much. So, I'm not entirely sure, and I think Steve said he isn't either, um, how this is going to happen, but what's great to me is um, there's an appetite now for nonfiction. Sorry, Jay, I know I should be uh, you know, beholden to narrative films too. My parents were screenwriters, they wrote them. But, uh, but what I've always been drawn to is documentary nonfiction. And um, yeah, the appetite is there, the, um, the technology is so much better now. I mean, I think that documentaries began to get a little bit better when they stopped shooting them on 35 millimeter. So 16 millimeter was already a great advance. You could go more places with lighter equipment. And uh, now, God, 
And when I made Hearts and Minds, we had a, a 100 to 1 ratio of uh, what was shot to what was actually going to become a film. Now, <laughs> with the equipment that exists today, you can shoot a thousand to one and not even think about it. So all of these kinds of things help nonfiction. And now we've just got to figure out the distribution as well as American Airlines has. There's a question. The impact, the release, I mean, Alan Dater's here too. I was just thinking, Deb Ellis is also a documentary filmmaker who's here with us today. Um, anything you want to add to that? I mean, yeah, just in terms I, of... I, I think a, a big question for a big question for some documentary filmmakers, if, if you're making a film that has an issue uh, that's currently uh, important to the political scene or social issues, you, you want to get this information out as quickly as possible. Uh, and there's YouTube sitting there uh, willing to take anything uh, by, by just sort of throwing it into the wind like that. You lose all of your um, maybe economic returns or, or anything. It just kind of goes and people can grab it and use it. And that, that for us is a big question for our latest film, uh, which is about uh, the biomass industry. It's just, people need to know about it. Nobody knows about what's going on. So, we don't know what to do. <laughs> uh, so here we have two partners that, uh, one says it's fabulous and the other says I don't know what to do. We, we don't know. <laughs> I understand. That's the nature of the dilemma, I think. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, um, I can speak to the other end of education as a film historian teaching in departments of film studies that it's only been really recently that uh, documentary studies has come into its own. So I think there'll be more opportunity for documentary uh, to be, you know, to be distributed in, you know, in universities. But really up until now, those departments were very niche and you know you'd learn about the French New Wave over and over again but you would never learn anything about you know good documentaries and then the other thing is a lot of these academics they'll choose some it's another problem but they'll choose some other niche film uh, you know or a, a documentary that has animation and and live action in over you know, as you pointed out, maybe some very significant, uh, you know, socially impactful films. So, but it's, I think it's getting better because you now have documentary studies front and center as being a discipline. So. Yeah, I think that, um, I mean, one of the, ch so there are many more opportunities to get documentary seen. I think what, what 
all of us have grown up with to a certain extent is the idea of a film that has its moment, you know, a film that becomes an event. You know, Hoop, Hoop Dreams became an event. It had its moment, right? It took on a life of its own. Um, and I think that that is actually harder to do in this Netflix world that you describe. Although we're having a banner year, right? I mean, up until this year, I think there was a feeling that the documentary, um, not the quality of the films, but that um, the economic model was starting to fade uh, in terms of distribution. You know, uh, you go to major festivals and documentaries weren't selling, or they weren't selling for what they people thought they deserved to sell for. But this year has kind of flipped that on its head with uh, RBG, with Won't You Be My Neighbor, with Three Identical Strangers. I mean, those are three films that have done incredible. They they catapulted themselves into the top probably 20 all-time grossing documentaries in a single year. So it's a it's a great year <laughs> for the economic model of documentary right now. But but when you look at two of those three at least, Three Identical Strangers is the exception. They are also films about iconic figures. Right. And and biographies are huge in the commercial documentary world because and are and also really highly current but controversial events or you know those are the kind of things that sell when they do sell, right? Three identical strangers is a little different because it's a, it's an amazingly crazy wild story that I think on it and and the great reviews it's gotten has driven that film. But um, but you know currency and and a built-in audience for a film is is a big part of what makes for a successful documentary you know commercially i think which is good and too bad it's that limiting right so that it had those are films that have some specific uh commercial appeal documentary i mean your film life itself about roger ebert didn't do so well didn't do so well no uh oh well not, not theatrically no it was a big disappointment okay well, um, and of course, Three Identical Strangers is sort of sensational also. Yes. And so there's that question. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I showed a Frederick Wiseman film recently, you know, it was three hours and 20 minutes long, Ex Libris, and I think it's a fabulous film, but a third of the audience walked out. I mean, it's, you know, because it's long and because it is, it doesn't have any dramatic structure right. to it either. And a lot of documentary films, I think, probably increasingly do. Uh, because, I mean, Moe's film, Shame, is riveting, you know, I mean, and it has a lot of dramatic punch, and you go with it, and, you know, I mean, Hoop Dream, same thing, you know. Um, so there's that question of, of what audiences, I mean, and how we expand audiences' uh, interest and ability to go where they don't know they're going to go and, and experience styles that are not necessarily immediately gratifying. I mean, I think that's also true. Um, anyway, I'd like to open it to the audience uh, to, to uh, have some comments, but Peter, do you want to say anything? I see you thinking in a way that words are spilling out. <laughs> Not really. I think opening it to the audience is a great idea um, so that we can really have a conversation um, w with each other. This question of distribution, we're not going to solve here, but it's a huge one, and I feel like we're on the verge of something that I can't even imagine, but that you'll be, you're going to be able to just turn on your computer and there'll be a rainbow of choices and you'll be able to say, yeah, I want to see Three Identical Ch Strangers. I want to see it right now. Probably you'll have to pay something. Um, Definitely. Okay, but for a dollar fifty, see Three Identical Strangers. Okay, great. Uh, no. Other people want to talk. I can, I can take, I'll take the mic around. Yeah. Also, uh, Lloyd brought up I mean, who was who saw Abacus last night. Uh, that's in this crowd. Yes. I mean, Steve talked about the organization in Chicago that he works with, Cartemquin Films, which is really uh, serving that community and also now because it's grown larger, a source for uh, developing filmmakers to come and, and really nurturing talent. Uh, there may be a moment where we can touch a little bit on that. We talked about it last night at the Abacus screening, but maybe at least briefly, Steve, if you could sort of lay that out, what, what Cartemplin does, this notion of...
filmmaking as a community interactive resource and learning uh, vehicle, uh, that'd be great. And then, then let's have some questions. And well, Cartemquin has a long history with New Day Films. It goes back many, many years. So, um, you know, when, when I was first came to Chicago, they were New Day was very big at, a part of Cartemquin. Um, yeah, so Cartemquin is this, it started as a uh, film collective back in the 60s at, with this idea of doing social impact filmmaking. Um, and it's still, main, it's not a collective anymore. That, that part didn't quite work. Um, but it, it, it has that collective sensibility, which is, is it's, it's, a, it's a place where filmmakers uh, come and bring their projects through Cartemquin. Cartemquin acts as a, um, not just a fiscal sponsor, but also as a production house, um, full service, um, has gear, edit rooms, you know, everything. You have the expertise of, of the people who've been there and Gordon Quinn, the, one of the founders, um, you know, who, who can not only help you um, creatively, but also help you in terms of how you go about trying to get the film done and, and out in the world. Um, it's grown as an organization. It used to be just a few people. I've seen it go up and down over the years, but now it's in a great place. They have a, a substantial staff, and it's, and it's a model that I'm surprised hasn't really been duplicated that I know of to any real degree in other cities because you know their whole thing is to create this community of filmmakers where you have all of this you 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 can work on each other's films you we have the the screenings of Cartemquin where people will come through and screen not just their work at Cartemquin but people who are making films that have nothing to do with Cartemquin will come through Chicago and do a screening at Cartemquin with the sort of group of Cartemquin people so that they can have their film ripped apart uh, to be made better. Um, <laughs> that's kind of what happens. Um, but it's a, it is a community, and one of the things I was saying last night is, is that one of, the, one of the, I think, one of the unfortunate byproducts of what is otherwise a really great development, which is, it used to be when some of us older filmmakers on the panel, um, you know, in order to get a film made, you had to have access to expensive gear, and uh, access to uh, a house with the proper systems to edit and whatever it was, you know. And then if you were shooting 16, you had to have money for a 16 millimeter film. Um, so it, it took a community to make a film. It used to be. <laughs> Nowadays, you know, you can own a pretty damn impressive camera for a couple of thousand dollars if that's all you have. You can edit on your laptop. People can make documentaries by themselves and. There's something empowering about that socioeconomically, but the, the unfortunate byproduct of that is is that people are making films by themselves and oftentimes not engaging in a community that can help them make their films better and, and, and encourage them as well as give them critical feedback. And so uh, I, that's one thing that Cartemquin has. But I, I would love to see this model duplicated. Uh, I'm not quite sure why it hasn't, honestly. Well, I can take the mic out there. Of course, funding is also always an issue. Boston Film and Video Foundation, for example, was not developed as far as Cartemquin and didn't have that sort of strong critical mass, but it did serve the community. Yeah. And, and lack of National Endowment for the Arts funding, MacArthur Foundation, which in Chicago probably is a source of support. It, no? It, well, yes? MacArthur is a support, and they do get some institutional funding, but, but the way it works at Cartemquin is, is that the films themselves are part of what sustain the organization. So they provide services in exchange for that. Not all the money spent on a film goes out of house. Some of the, you know, they have the staff there that work on the film and do things. They have a staff editor that works on films, not all films, but some films. So there's ways in which it, 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 the films themselves sustain the organization and vice versa. Cool. Okay, so boys do have a microphone if anybody wants to ask any We've questions. Got questions. Yes. Nancy, you got a question in the back? I'll come back Good morning. Uh, so I feel like the words ethics and empathy get like thrown around in our work all the time and I'm just curious how you talk to maybe new filmmakers or how your relationship um, to your understanding of ethics in the work that you do as doc filmmakers has evolved over time. Who wants this one? I, mean, I feel like I've been talking a lot. Want to go um, 
That's a great question because I myself don't necessarily consider myself a journalist. I consider myself a storyteller first. I just work within the medium of nonfiction. However, it's not lost on me that by taking on a role as a documentarian, I do have a responsibility. And um, so, for example, one of the limitations that I will say comes with documentaries, especially the, some of the documentaries that I do, uh, uh, where I am covering um, either political or sociopolitical issues in South Asia or in the Middle East, is that I will take a huge amount of stuff or information and context for granted because I grew up there, I knew, I know it, but I'm also now bringing this to a world audience. So I have to distill it down and sometimes dumb it down so much, you know, for a broader audience to kind of digest what I'm bringing forth, that it becomes problematic for me, right? And I think for me then, how I try to address that is I try to change my telling and construction of the narrative that I'm ethically within the bounds that I'm sound in telling the story that I'm telling and I'm conveying whatever information or, or context that I am without boring the shit out of everyone. Uh, this, I, with my most recent film, Inshallah Democracy, which is playing here tomorrow at 1.30. Um, one o'clock. One o'clock, sorry. I had three completed cuts before I threw them away. And I did my final, final cut. And they were all going somewhere until obviously my, my final, final cut, but this was a huge challenge for that film. So Inshallah Democracy is essentially, it's a story about um, me voting for the first time in Pakistan um, in, in the 2013 elections. The reason uh, I hadn't voted before is because I mostly lived my life under a military coup or, um, or I was too young. Well, actually it was mostly because I was under a military coup and they were like, and then, then we had democracy again and uh, so we could vote. And so I was gonna vote for the first time in my life. And the options I had were um, a Taliban sympathizer, um, a, a, a really, really corrupt uh, politician who'd been charged on several incidents of um, corruption. And then, and then this relatively nice, moderate, um, liberal guy who happened to be a former military dictator. Uh, so those were my choices, and within that scope, um, and, and I, I set out to make a documentary trying to vet out these candidates one-on-one, -on -one. and there was just so much history that was specific to each candidate that wouldn't really carry forward and translate to, to an international audience. By my last cut, I actually threw myself in the film, and I became the protagonist. I was never the protagonist of the film where it's about me and my relationship um, with one of the candidates that I initially at least potentially favor, um, who is the former military dictator. And then I get to know him, and then I'm like, haha, I was kidding, <laughs> I was so wrong. But anyway, that, that's the whole journey. And, and, and so I was able to do that because I, construct, I changed it the, the, the construction, so yeah. Maybe I'll just say a word about ethics and your subjects um, in films uh, for and that is that um, And for me, this is evolved over the years, you know, I too also don't think of myself as a journalist um, and there are certain there are certain There are certain ethical obligations that journalists have as I understand them that I don't think necessarily apply to documentary filmmakers, but that's not a, by way of letting us off the hook. Um, you know, most journalism does not um, share the film with subjects before it's done, or the article. It doesn't make sense in everyday journalism, it's impossible. But when you're doing long form and you're really engaged in, in, in people's lives, you know, I feel an absolute obligation 
to share the film with them before it's done. Not like right before it's done to say, hey, do you like it or not? Invite them to the premiere and say, hey, what did you think? Um, but to share it with them at a point in time when you can actually engage with your subjects about what your portrayal of them is. And I've had to do that with subjects that I have real confidence are, are going to really like the film. And I've done that with subjects that I knew were not going to like the film. But I still felt an obligation to do that. And I think that's part, that's something we, we owe the subjects. Because my sense of it is, is that in, in the way I work, is, is that I, I do try to have this approach where I feel like the subjects in the film have a certain kind of agency. It's limited, admittedly, because I'm the filmmaker, but a certain kind of agency in this process so that I'm making the film with them, not just on them. And that doesn't let me off the hook to make it honest and candid and say no to certain things they might not like in the film. No, it's going to stay in the film, but it does create, I think, a level of trust that ultimately um, makes me feel better about what I'm doing and makes them feel better about being in the film. I also believe that subjects, if a film makes money, um, not while the film is being made, for sure, but I often have a conversation with the subjects of my films. All, I always have a conversation at some point, usually late in the process, ideally after filming has been completed, to say that if this film makes money, that we will figure out a way for you to share in the profit of that film. Because I feel that, again, it's not something you do in journalism, but I feel like in documentary it's different. And given how much they have given to this process of their lives, put their lives, allow you to put the lives on the screen, that they should share in that, but not at a point where it affects the story you're telling, but after the fact, um, so that the film can have the integrity of documenting their lives the way you encounter them. But if they can benefit from it after the fact, I think that's a wonderful thing. I. Uh to be on this panel with these great filmmakers is uh, very humbling. Uh, my approach is a bit different, I think, than Moe's and perhaps Steve's. Uh, in making Dateline Saigon, I wanted to try to keep myself out of the film. And before uh, becoming a filmmaker, um, I practiced journalism for quite a number of years. So I do think of myself as a journalist. Your question about ethics um, is, is a broad question and uh, I'll try to narrow it to a, to a specific point. I think we owe ethical uh, commitments uh, to, to, to different uh, audiences or different uh, groups of people in making a film, to, to the audience, to the backers, uh, to fellow filmmakers. Uh, I just want to address um, the ethics that I feel are owed to the subjects of the film, uh, which is to try my best to let them tell their story honestly and try to get out of the way. And I'll be very specific here. When I started Dateline Saigon, I thought, you know, what happened to the country during Vietnam? There was a sea change. There was a a, a, a real crisis of national conscience and a, co a coming of national age in many ways. So I felt that, but then I, w uh, I wanted to, to ask the subjects of the film to, s to see if anything like that happened without my, by asking questions which touched on that theme, but without having my preconceptions. Uh, get in the way or wishing that they would give me the answer I wanted to hear uh, and I hope I succeeded I think it's uh, uh, for the audience to determine uh, three of the principal characters of my film are no longer with us and we're no longer I no longer was able to show it to them to say what did you think uh, I was very nervous uh, for the two surviving filmmaker uh, uh, subjects of the film when I first showed it to them to, uh, to, uh, to, to see how they would react. But it was important to me to let them tell their story honestly, with, guided in part by uh, our interviews, 
but to be true to their story and not necessarily to mine. That was the ethical challenge uh, and goal that I had. Listening to what my colleagues, fellow panelists, have said, something has occurred to me. We all work very differently. And it's important to remember that, that you want to be true to yourself. What I feel about, really, I have two words, that uh, it's not exactly journalism, um, most documentary film making now, but it is a journey. So we go on that journey and uh, we take it in different ways. I love the way Steve described what he does with his subjects. That isn't the way I've ever worked, but it's so wonderful to hear him talk about it. it it's not only ethical, um, what Steve said, it's, um, it's, it, it's completely admirable, and yet we don't all work that way. The other thing, the other word I want to use um, when we go on this journey, and it's a journey of discovery. Uh, if you know what your film is before you start, that would be a very boring kind of thing. That's one of the reasons I've never wanted to be in fiction film, um, because I like working without a script, not knowing what you're going to get the following day. But the other word I wanted to use, and actually Tom used this word, is humility. Uh, we don't know. We don't know what's best for our subjects. We usually don't know what's best for our film. But we're taking this journey. And in order to get to the end of the journey, um, uh, we need to discover a word that Mo used, we need to discover our story at some point. What's this story that we're going to tell? And when we get that, um, we've got it. But you still, but you have to approach it, I think, with a great deal of humility. What a wonderful end to our conversation, uh, Peter, and all of you. Very generous in your comments. Really appreciate it. Wonderful. Very good. Um,